start recording. Great, thank you, and welcome everybody to our uh, webinar today on on AdCERC through the Design Safe program. So uh, this is showing the current you know um, front page of of Design Safe. You can go check it out. There's a nice story here about the uh, FIU Wall of Wind, and you can find links here to the workspace and learning center and so forth. A recording of this webinar will be available later through our learning center uh, in about a week or so, um, along with all of the other past webinars that we've done. Uh, my name is Scott Brandenburg. I'm at UCLA and one of the co-PIs for the Design Safe project. Um, and I, let's make sure I can advance slides. So uh, one thing is that we appreciate your feedback on these webinars. Um, if you'd like to scan that QR code with your phone, it will pull up a form where we can where we gather feedback and improve these uh, these webinars over time. Um, for me, that that QR code brought up an old version of the website that was cached in my phone's memory. So I didn't see Clint's webinar for today on there. If if that happens to you, you can go into private mode and it will come up with the right webinar. But you should see the first one on May 17th for this AdCERC 101 webinar. All right, so our presenter today is Clint Dawson, who is the Department Chair of Aerospace Engineering and Engineering Mechanics at UT Austin and the head of the Computational Hydraulics Group in the Odin Institute. He has over 25 years of experience in storm surge modeling and high-performance computing, and he's one of the Design Safe uh, management team members, so we're on Zoom calls together all the time, and um, he's going to talk to you today about AdCERC version, specifically version 55, how to run it through Design Safe and potentially use uh, high performance computing allocation if you have one of those, which is available through TAC. And um, I think, Clint, at this time, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. And, and thanks very much for being here to deliver this webinar. Thanks, Scott. Okay, so I hope everybody can see my screen. Um, this is going to, I'm going to try to make this very informal. And I hope that any questions you have, um, we can wait till the end. Or if you want to interrupt me while I'm, while I'm speaking, I just, I do have a hard stop at three o'clock. So I'm going to try to wrap this up by three and this is supposed to be an introduction to how to run AdCERC on DesignSafe, but also I'm going to show you a little bit about how we archive um, our data on DesignSafe and then give you a few tips on how you could start to publish a data set. <clears throat> so just a little background on AdCERC. AdCERC stands for Advanced Circulation Model. It's been around for about 30 years now in one incarnation or another. It was started by Rick Ludic and Johannes Westerink. And now we have what's called the AdCERC Users Group, which is a very large community, worldwide community that uh, develops and runs the code for various applications. Um, it's a coastal ocean code. Um, primarily, it solves the uh, shallow water equations in depth average form, and it solves for the uh, water elevation above a datum, usually mean sea level or some reference point, and um, water velocities, and as well as some other quantities, which I'll talk about in a minute. So within Design Safe, <clears throat> the reason that AdCERC is in Design Safe is because it is a is used to model um, storm surge that is induced by wind, so hurricane winds. And <clears throat> so a lot of the applications that we look at are um, related to hurricane storm surge. Uh, AdCERC is a finite element code. It's an unstructured um, code that uses triangular meshes on either 2D Cartesian or spherical domains, you can either enter your data 
in uh, XY coordinates, or you can enter it in latitude, longitude. Um, <clears throat> to run AdCERC um, is, requires some knowledge. I'm not gonna say that it's easy. Uh, it requires several input files that, for example, it requires a mesh file, which I'll say a little bit about in a minute. And um, unless you're dealing with a very simple mesh that you can create yourself, you'll need to use a, another package such as uh, the surface modeling system, surface water modeling system, SMS, or another uh, open source code called OpenMesh2D to generate the input file and the associated files that uh, the mesh file and the associated input files that go with it. So today I'm mostly going to focus on the uh, parallel version of AdCERC, which we call PADCERC. It's been around for quite a while. It runs on all of the machines at TAC and at, at machines at other places. So it uh, runs on multi-core computers. It's a MPI code. It does not use shared memory. It uses distributed memory. Now there's another model uh, in Design Save called ASERT plus SWAN, <clears throat> and that solves the shallow water equations plus the spectrally averaged wave equation, um, the wave action balance equation. So ASERT solves the shallow water equations and then is connected to this other code called SWAN, which solves the wave action balance equation. And so this code can be helpful when you're trying to account for uh, waves that can impact storm surge. So there's a, a, a whole theory behind how these waves interact with uh, the water column and they can enhance storm surge in the coast. So the SWAN model was not developed by our group. It was developed at Delft University in the Netherlands. And um, so we're using a version of SWAN that was uh, um, developed a few years ago, and um, SWAN continues to evolve. Um, and it can also, SWAN can also be run by itself. Uh, SWAN and ADSERC use the same finite element mesh, so there's not a lot of, uh, there's not a whole lot of work to be done to run with SWAN turned on. It's just another couple of files, and I'm not going to go into how to run ADSERC plus SWAN today. I'm going to just focus mainly on ADSERC. But PADC SWAN is the parallel version of ADCERT plus SWAN. If you want to know about how to run that code, it's just a couple of extra files. I'll be happy to talk to you offline about that. Um, there is a website that has a documentation on ADCERT called uh, adcert.org. Um, some of the uh, documentation is a little bit out of date, but it... Uh, it does have documentation on version 53 of ADCIRC, and that is close to version 55. So probably most of your questions can be answered by looking at that documentation. And also, if you are really want to become a hardcore ADCIRC user, there's a, an ADCIRC boot camp that's held every spring. This year, it will be in Baton Rouge. And it's run by Jason Fleming, and his email address is there. Um, the we didn't have the boot camp in person for the last couple of years because of the pandemic, but we're starting it up again, and I expect that it will be run every spring from now on. <clears throat> also, uh, there are different versions of of AdCert that are typically released every couple of years. And the latest release version is version 55. Um, the main changes to version 55 have to do with some internal algorithmic uh, changes to the model. And also it's just able to handle um, larger domains. For example, it's being run on the entire, on a domain that basically captures the entire globe. And it also has a, and it's connected to a CI uh, module. So <clears throat> if you want to get access to the source code, you can contact um, Zach Koble at, uh, Zach, at this, at this uh, email address here, and he will uh, 
link you up with the AdCert GitHub repository where you can download the um, version of the code that's most the, the most uh, recent release version. Okay, so let's get into the, the meat of uh, p -Adser. So I mentioned this mesh file. And by the way, we are old. Uh, AdCirc is a Fortran code. The people that wrote it, such as myself, are old uh, Fortran uh, programmers. So we use sort of archaic uh, mesh naming, uh, you know, um, style. And uh, so a lot of the files start with fort, which means it's a Fortran input file. It's basically just an ASCII file. So uh, if you are familiar with running AdCirc, you know that fort.14 is the mesh file. And the mesh file contains the X and Y coordinates of each vertex or node in the triangular mesh and the bathymetry at that node. And the bathymetry is, is a positive downward. So if it's if you see a positive bathymetry, that means you have water there. If it's negative, that means that it's dry. Uh, then 4.15 <clears throat> is what we call the control parameter file that has things like some parameters that have to do with uh, whether you're using uh, Cartesian or spherical coordinates. Uh, are you doing a restart? What's your time step? How many days are you going to run? Are you including tides or not? Uh, output control, et cetera. Um, and then there's a 4.13 file, which is a nodal attributes file that kind of goes along with the mesh. So at every uh, coordinate, x, y coordinate, we need to know things like the uh, bottom friction and some other quantities. And those are uh, input into the, by 4.13. And we call those nodal attributes, and, and those can be generated through, <coughs> through our mesh generation software. Now, if you're going to run a hurricane, you're going to need a wind file. And um, <clears throat> the uh, common uh, wind file uh, attributes that we use are called 4.22, 4.221, et cetera. So 4.22 is a short wind parameter file, but the main wind data is in uh, would be in 4.221 and 4.222. That would be the wind and atmospheric pressure defined over some usually Cartesian uniform uh, domain that we then interpolate onto the AdSERP mesh. Uh, we do not provide wind files. Those are usually available from other sources such as NOAA. Now, <clears throat> once you run AdCirc, then there's a number of output files that are generated. Um, so again, going back to this sort of old fashioned naming convention, uh, Fort.63. So that's the time history of water elevation. Uh, anything with a 63 at the end has to do with water elevation. Um, that's actually a typo uh, in the fourth line. Uh, Anything to do with 64 is a water velocity, time history of water velocity, or a snapshot of, of, some, of some quantity. So uh, max ELE.63 is the maximum um, water elevation. Max VEL is the maximum water velocity. And then <clears throat> the, the wind data is given in uh, files that are start with a seven, so Fort dot seventy three, Fort dot seventy four, and then the snapshots of wind and atmospheric pressure are given in max w, w e l and min p e r, and I'll I'll show you some of these files in a little bit. All right, now <clears throat> um, to run AdCirc in the Design Safe portal, you have to log into the Design Safe website. Um, you go to tools and applications in the workspace, and I'll walk, I'll walk through this in a live demo in a second. You click on simulation and you click on uh, AdCirc. And then <clears throat> it's going to bring up, when you click on AdCirc, you're going to get, it's going to look like this. So this is the workspace. This is the, excuse me, this is the, uh, um, um, simulation works part of the workspace. 
and <clears throat> you'll see a number of available simulators, some of the, um, the older versions we've gotten rid of, but um, we still have a, a AdCERC version 51, version 52, and we have AdCERC version 55. These are all serial versions of the code. And then the parallel versions are PADCERT version 55 and PADC SWAN version 55. So those will come up when you start to um, submit a job, which when you click on AdCERT, then this screen will come up. So there's a little bit of background. It will actually point you to some documentation if you want to look at it. <clears throat> and You'll see these uh, prompts here on the right. So where it says input directory, that's where you'll select um, where your input files are located. And again, I'll walk through that in just a second. Then you have to set your maximum job runtime. Um, and here you wanna probably, it depends on the size of your run and how many uh, nodes you have in your domain, but uh, you can run up to 48 hours. Um, most jobs would probably not use that amount of time, but um, it may take, you know, you might want to just type in something there like 10 hours, It'd probably be good enough. Um, <clears throat> then it's going to uh, create a job name. And I usually just use the default job name. Um, this is a job name that was generated automatically the other day when I tested it. Um, I was running on Frontera, which is one of our machines, et cetera. It tells you what day you were running and what time. Um, I usually just use the, uh, the um, default uh, job outlook location. So it'll just default to a specific directory. Um, and then you have to choose the number of uh, nodes that you want to use and the number of processors. So a node is a cluster of processors. And each node, say, has on Frontera, for example, has 56 uh, processors uh, that you can have access to. So uh, if we run on three nodes with 56 processors, then we're going to get 100 and um, 68, something like that, nodes, uh, uh, processors that we would run on. And I think the, the maximum number of nodes that one can choose is 12. Okay, so let me, um, let me go into the actual site and show this to you. <clears throat> and, um, Okay, so I'm in my Design Safe account here. Um, go to Workspace, go to Tools and Applications. <clears throat> go to Simulation. You see AdCERC here. Um, the first thing it's going to ask you is what version of AdCERC you want to run. So there's a drop down menu. And there's a few more things. There's some um, Stampede, Frontera than what I showed you earlier. But let's say I want to run PADCERC on Frontera version 55. Okay. So, whoops, sorry. All right. So there's the screen that I just showed you a minute ago. Now I need to select my input directory. Um, let me go to design safe test cases. And let me choose, uh, actually, let me go back. Let me choose this. Select that again. Let me go to, okay, these are my test cases. And then I want to select. Ike EC 2001. Say I give it 10 hours to run. So you type 10. 
colon zero zero colon zero zero. This I'm just going to leave alone. Go down. Node count. There's a drop down menu box over here, a little arrow. So I'm going to choose 12 nodes and 56 processors. And then I submit my job. Okay, I see there's a couple of questions. Will these slides be shared at the end of the session? Yes, they will be. Um, and I'll answer the other one later. Okay. Um, all right, so now it's running. You can see uh, that it says staging inputs over here in this job status uh, column. Okay, and as it, um, as it, Get, as it as it starts to execute, it's queued, and then it it'll tell you that it's running, and then it'll tell you that it's finished. So, for example, once a once a job is finished, then you can click on more info. Here, it'll tell you um, that the job finished. It was submitted at such and such a time. It finished at such and such a time, and then you can click on this output view and it will take you directly to where the output is. Okay, so here's the output directory. This is from a run that I did the other day. And here's my, here are both of my input files and my output files. So these are all the output files that ADSERT generates. And then there's a lot of other stuff as well, but okay. So now everything that was generated that was used and generated by that run is in this file. So you can download the mesh that was used, that control parameters. You can download this entire directory and we'll talk about how to do that in just a second. <laughs> okay, um, any questions at this point? Okay, let me go back. Slides. <clears throat> okay, so once you've run a simulation, then your output is stored in the data depot, and um, it will the directory that you selected when you submitted your job is where your output will be. Um, and of course you can always go to it by clicking on the job as I just showed you and viewing your output. Um, now you can also um, create a project and I'll talk a little bit more about in that in, in just a minute. When you're, uh, when you want to, to save all of your data and make sure that you don't lose it, and you want to share it with other people, then you can move it into a project and you can publish it and get the data into a, 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 publishable, form, a publishable form, which would have a DOI. Um, <clears throat> now, you can also run AdCERC within Design Safe from a command line. So if you have an account on TAC, like a, an allocation, then you can uh, open up a Jupyter terminal and you can um, uh, select, well, you have to go through some steps to get to Jupyter, which I'll show you in just a second. But once you get into the terminal, then you can SSH into Frontera or Stampede 2 or Lone Star 5 or wherever you have an allocation and you can use your standard uh, commands that you would use if you were running directly on TAC. So going back to the workspace and the tools and applications. Okay, Jupyter is under analysis. So we get Jupyter. We launch Jupyter uh, notebook. I just happened to have one running earlier. So once I'm in this screen, the Jupyter Hub screen, 
I go over here to new and I go down to terminal and it will give me just a regular terminal. Okay. And then I can SSH into say Frontera. And once I'm in Frontera, I won't go through all these steps, but once you're in there, then it's just like you're on um, attack mm -hmm. uh, screen. Now you might say, well, why would I, why wouldn't I just go directly to attack screen? Well, this is particularly useful uh, when you wanna move data into design safe that very large amounts of data. So in this screen, you have access to all of your design safe data, your projects, your data, your all of that and so <clears throat> um, once you've run something it's easy to move things at least for me to you just use secure copy scp and copy things over into uh, design safe at least that's one way to do it okay so now let me go back to my slides <clears throat> yeah, so before I go into uh, publishable, how to publish data, um, all the use cases, we have a lot of use cases on Design Safe that you can um, play around with, and they're all at this uh, website. And there's some specific use cases that you can see. Um, these are all the design safe use cases. These are specific to AdCirc and they have uh, Jupyter notebooks that go along with them. So if you wanna play around with those, just go to that, those particular locations. Okay, archiving your output. So one of the nice things about design safe is that if you are, if you're um, a little bit you know, um, careful, you will never lose your output. And I don't know if you're like me, but I have lost so much output over the years, it's ridiculous. So <clears throat> the data that you store on Design Safe will not go away. Um, however, there's a limit on how much data you can store. And this is the uh, sort of this, the policies about uh, allocation of uh, memory, about of storage. So everybody gets 50 gigabytes. Um, you can write for a, it's very easy to get a startup allocation, which would be a terabyte. A research allocation requires a little bit more work, but you can get a hundred terabytes and, you know, that's actually a lot of data. I don't, I don't know. We, we, I don't know that we have that much data stored on design safe in, I mean, in all of TAC, to be honest with you. So that's a lot of data and it will, Again, it should be there um, years from now. So one of the nice things, again, is how you can create a project. Um, to create a new project, you go into the data depot and you click on add and you click on new project and it will walk you through a set of instructions that will help you set up a project. Now, one of the reasons to create a project is to curate your data. So in other words, organize your data, get it into a, a format that, that you can explain to other people, and then uh, ex to give some um, metadata, maybe some documentation that goes along with it, and then um, eventually publish it. So what I would suggest, and I'll, there's a few more slides on this towards the end, is that when you want to organize your data for a specific project that you're doing, uh, I suggest that you create an input directory and an output directory for each simulation or uh, group of simulations that you want to archive. And then, of course, you're going to move your input into the input directory and your output uh, into the output directory. So if you have input files that are shared across multiple simulations, that could be put in a 
a separate folder. It doesn't have to be copied to every uh, simulation that you did. For example, if the mesh is the same for every simulation, there's no reason to copy it into every directory. No reason to have 50 copies of it. Okay, just have one copy in a separate folder that ever that is recognizable. Um, I'll show you some published projects and we'll see how they're organized in just a minute. Um, so let me go back to the design safe. <clears throat> Okay, going back to the workspace, <clears throat> we go to the data depot. Okay, so the data depot has all of your personal data in it. So this is data that belongs to you that is not shared with anybody else. Um, I guess you can share some of it with some people, but this is this is data that you're working on. It's not data that you're ready to publish. <clears throat> okay, when you're ready to do a project, say with a group of other people, then you can create a project. So this are, these are all the projects that I have under my account. And um, if I want to create a new project, I click on add, click on new project, and then it's going to walk me through a number of of questions so i have to give it a title i have to put who's the pi if i'm the pi then i would put my name there i can add other members to the project and um, anyway then i can create a project and then uh, there will be some more data that will be uh, added later on but this is the these are the minimum amount of questions that you need to answer to start a project so for this webinar, I created a project <clears throat> called AdCirc Webinar 2023, which I'm happy to share with anyone. Um, so this is what the project looks like once it's created. It's got a project number, PRJ3959. Um, it, uh, so if, if I go over here and say edit project, then I can put in more information about the project. <clears throat> what kind of natural hazard are we talking about here? We're doing a storm surge, or you could say hurricane, tropical storm, earth, you know, there's earthquake, fire, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Uh, the PI, my name, project members. If you want to add a project member, you put it under, sorry. You put it under here. Um, let's say I want to add. Uh, well, I'll, I think I'm not going to do this right now. So, I, if I if it's funded by a, a uh, an award like an NSF grant, you could put the award name and the award number. Um, <clears throat> you can reference other published data that was used to create the data set. You give it the DOI. Um, and then you can talk about the specific event that you're modeling. For example, if it's a specific hurricane or a group of hurricanes, then you can add some information about the event. And you have to put in some keywords, and then you have to put in a project description. <clears throat> okay. So I didn't make any changes. All right. So <clears throat> if I want to add a directory under this project, um then i go into the project okay here's a, a directory that i added i can add a new folder okay using this link i've already created <clears throat> um, two folders called inputs and outputs for my demo test case Now let's say that I want to add some data to this input directory. Okay. All right. So let me go back to 
the job that I showed you a minute ago. Okay, and let's say that I want to copy all of my input files over to that input directory. So I click on the files that I want to copy. I click on copy here. There's a pull down menu, say my projects. <clears throat> Go to Add Circ Webinar, demo test case, and I want to copy it to inputs, so I start copying. Okay. And then all those files are, are being copied over. Now let's say I want to copy my output files. So let me just select a few of my output files. <clears throat> so I want to copy those three files. Again, I hit copy. My projects. And then I click on copy under my output directory and it will copy those files over. So now if I go back to the workspace, go to my projects, okay, there's all my input files that I copied over. And there's the output files that I copied over, okay? All right, now, <clears throat> so a more uh, developed project that's been published is this Texas FEMA hurricane winds and surge project. Um, this is the complete um, project with all of the executable uh, executable files that was were that were used um, the report that describes what we're doing here that goes along with all of the simulations um, the mesh that we used for the simulations and then this was a case where we ran, about 440 storms. So you can see there, there's there's a bunch of storms here that are labeled. And you can go into any of these directories. And there's your output. You can also look at the output that was generated for this particular storm. Okay. All right, now I mentioned published data. If you want to uh, let's see the published projects are. Browse data publications over here. And this gives you a list of all of the projects that have been published recently. Here's one that was just published the other day um, called, that's another uh, collection of hurricanes. 
Um, and if you want to get access to all of this data, you click on download data set and it will um, download the entire uh, data set. Okay. Now it's a big data set, so it may require some help from TAC getting a large data set downloaded. Um, but I'll leave that for another uh, um, webinar. Okay. <clears throat> um, all right. So the last thing I wanted to mention, going talking about publishing data, I talked about organizing your data. Okay, so just some best practices. So include the executables that you use. So if you ever want to run the job again, you don't want to have to search for the executable that you use. As I mentioned, group inputs and outputs into separate directories. Um, group inputs and outputs for different simulations into distinct directories. So for example, if each event has a different set of win files, you would want to put that in a different in the directory that goes with that simulation. Um, and then put common files used across all simulations, such as mes mesh files in a separate directory. <clears throat> all right, so there's a whole lot of information about curating data. Um, it uh, can be a little bit um, daunting at first, to do this. And so I would recommend that you um, go to uh, the Design Safe um, Help Center and uh, set up office hours with, with Maria Esteva, Esteva, who is our data curator. And she can walk you through um, the basic steps and how to uh, best publish a data set and how to provide appropriate metadata and so forth. And we're also putting together a, a best practices guide on how to publish um, data. And we'll we'll have a section in there about ways that we have published uh, ad cert data that we feel like will work for a lot of different applications. So <clears throat> that's all I have. Um, I'm happy to answer questions at this point. Hey, thanks, Clint. There's a few questions online. Not sure if you can see them or not. Okay. Yeah, I can see the Q&A. All right. Uh, let's see. Yes, the slides will be shared. Um, thank you for the nice presentation. I'm just curious why Sim Center decided to incorporate AdCERC instead of other softwares like Slosh or Delft 3D. Okay, so... <clears throat> I'm not sure about the Sim Center, or if you're talking about Design Safe, the reason that Design Safe included AdCERC is because I know AdCERC and I don't know Slush and Dell 3D as well. Um, but and Slosh, I know Slosh is a publicly available code. We would just have to find someone um in the slosh or say if it was delf 3d we'd have to find someone from one of the development teams for those codes to help us with providing user support and training and uh, making sure that the code can run on design safe so there's just some there's a lot of overhead in getting a code to run on design safe and you need someone who knows what they're doing so that's the best reason i can think of but there's, it's not that those codes are not useful or have any, the AdCERC's any, you know, it, not, we're not saying that AdCERC's the best. It's useful for what it does. And those codes are great. And um, perhaps in future versions of Design Safe, going, uh, if we have another uh, round of funding, we might put, we might expand the list of codes. We've included other codes, but the problem is if we don't have someone dedicated for user support, it, they kind of, uh, tend to fade away. Um, 
Oh, Sarav is asking, where do we upload the input file so that it can be accessed? Okay, that's a good question. Um, yes, and then how can we know the maximum job runtime in advance? So Lance, let me answer the last question first. Um, the, uh, the best answer to that question is overestimate. Um, if you think your job, well, first of all, if you've done, if you have any experience running AdCirc, um, I just know from my experience, it, let's say that you're, this is sort of a back of the envelope calculation. Let's say that your run, that your mesh has a million nodes. Okay, so it, it's a million nodes. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's really the only thing that matters is the size of the mesh. So if you have a million nodes, um, then for AdCert to scale well, we don't usually go below about two or 3,000 nodes per core. So if you have a million nodes, 2,000 nodes per core, what is that, 500? 500, um, 500 nodes, something, 500 cores, excuse me, not nodes, but uh, 500 cores. Uh, so if you, if you have access to 500 cores, <clears throat> and let's say you're doing a 10-day um, a simulation on a million nodes uh, with 500 cores would probably only take about 30 minutes of runtime. So let's, let's say you could probably be safe and put two hours in there. So you can scale up from that. If you have 10 million nodes and you only have access to 500 cores, you know, you're going to need, you're going to need 20 hours. You're going to need 10 times that amount to be able to, to run the job. So it scales pretty well with the number of processors. And um, Sarav, the way that the best way to upload input files, if they're big input files, is to is to use uh, SCP in the Jupyter terminal. Um, yeah, and, and uh, Carlos is saying a little bit about the how to estimate the runtime in the in the Q and A. So in the uh, there's a there's a uh, uh, in in one of those uh, test cases there's an AdCirc uh, ensemble simulation use case that um, you can get access to. And there's a scaling study that can help you uh, determine how many, uh, how much time you'll need to ask for. <clears throat> okay, so Sarav, let me just, uh, if I can share my screen again, I'll just walk you through that real quick. Um, All right, so <clears throat> for for us, for most of the um, the files, they're too big to load through the web, so we have to use SCP. But if they're not big files, you can go to Data Depot. Um, let's say I want to let, let's say I just want to upload a file here. Um, I can click on Add. I can do a file upload. I can choose a file from my um, computer. Uh, let me go to documents. Um, yeah, let's say this file small and click on begin upload and it will upload it. So there it is, okay. If it's a bigger file, um, and you need to use SCP, then you would need to go to Jupyter or to use Globus, and I'm not a Globus expert. The way I do it is through Jupyter. So I go to the terminal, 
<clears throat> and then here I have access to all my data. So I go to my data. There's all my uh, input. There's all my uh, folders in my in my data. Say I go to the folder that I want to copy it to. Say it's this one, and then I just type my usual SCP commands. Okay. Those are two ways that you can upload your data. Okay. Thanks so Any much. Other Does anybody have any more questions for Clint? How can we integrate this data with Hydro UQ? Okay, that's a good question. Um, I have no idea. <laughs> uh, is Hydro UQ through the, um, is that through the SIM Center? Or is that a separate, uh, I, I'm not familiar with Hydro UQ. SIM Center, okay. Then, <clears throat> yeah, so there, there's probably some SIM Center webinars on how to import data. Charlie, do you know how to um, import data from I, here? I do believe SIM Center and Design Safe share, share uh, like directory. my data folder as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you should so be able if that's to the case, move your, you should be able to have access to your data. Your, if you're running through SIM Center, then basically, we sh I think we we host all of the Sim Center data at Design Safe. So you should see that my data folder. And once you run a job, you should be able to access your output and then uh, move it wherever you have to to get to to run it through Hydro UQ. But I'm not an expert on that. Okay, on peer review, uh, have we done any? Are there any existing webinars on uh, peer review? Um, not in a while. Actually, that's a great idea uh, for maybe an upcoming webinar would be a peer review webinar. Yeah, we'll add that to the list of uh, webinars that we need to update. Yeah. Our, I do know peer review is very popular with our VIS team. They use that quite a bit, so which is why we have it on Design Safe as well. Yeah. Uh, but I will get with our biz team and see if we can put together a pair of you webinar, uh, one of the upcoming things. That's a great idea. Thank you, anonymous attendee. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, let me go ahead. If there's no more questions, let's go ahead and uh, and wrap this up. I'm going to go share my screen. And let me know if you all can see that. Oops. So um, I know everyone wants to know if you could, this this uh, particular webinar will be curated here shortly by our uh, visualization, or actually our, our marketing staff. And as soon as they're done with this, this will show up in our training archive. So you can go to designsafeci.org, Learning Center and Training, and then that's where all of our past webinars are going to be hosted at. You can also go to Design Safe's uh, YouTube page, and they're also uh, hosted there as well. Also, here is a QR code. I'm not sure if Scott shared this with you before or not. This QR code leads you to a survey. Uh, we would appreciate if you take it and give some feedback on uh, how, this, how this webinar went for you. Also, uh, there's a place for you to type in any future webinars that you would like to see. For example, a webinar on Paraview, which we'd be happy to uh, put together for you all. And actually, that's a really good idea. Um, a webinar on Hydro also, UQ. Uh, how to how to integrate oh, data with Hydro do. UQ? That would be good. I yeah. might I might sit on that sit in on that one myself. So uh, with that, thank you so much, Clint. Really appreciate your time and effort. Uh, it's always great to see you. Um, for all those who don't know, Clint put a very very three line bio on there. But if you put his true bio on there, it'd probably take about five pages. So <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, also, thank you to Ellen. Uh, Ellen Raff, GRPI, Tim Cockrell, our Deputy uh, Director of Design Safe, and then, of course, Scott Brandenburg, um, who is in charge of the training department. I'm the training lead, Charlie Day. And, of course, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to hit us up on Slack. 
or you can email us at training at designsafe.org or fill out a help ticket and we'll be happy to help you all out. Uh, I will say probably Slack would be the best place to uh, hit us up for questions if you have any that you think of after this webinar. All right. Uh, with that, thank you so much, Clint. I know you have a three o'clock uh, hard stop. Actually, I have a three o'clock hard stop as well. Uh, if anybody has any comments or questions, feel free to get in touch with us and we will see you all next time. Uh, thank you so much for your time and effort. Everyone have a great afternoon. And thank you.